it seems to me that one of the essential elements in tenderness is that it is a free act, a gratuitous act. It has an enormous amount to do with liberty, with freedom, because one chooses uh, to be tender. Uh, and, and in a certain sense, in face of so often what is surrounding us, I mean, it is, a, it is an almost defiant act uh, of freedom. I'm in John Berger's kitchen, which is an unusual place for me to find myself because Berger is one of the first people I started reading when I got to college. His book, G, had just come out. It was the first book I ever received for free in the mail from a publisher. And because it was followed almost immediately by a hugely different book, I said, this is very interesting. G, a novel of Don Giovanni, full of Kierkegaard and Mozart. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> um, but this is the novel of the seducer, and it's followed by novels by the storyteller. And I was very, very interested in that movement that took you essentially from being a person who plots, the G person, the seductive person, the writer of seduction and trickery, to a writer of a much simpler, a storytelling kind. What were you thinking of when you began G? Because it seems to be a place that you did not go back to. Well, Michael, but before I answer that, I, I'd like to say this, because if, if we're, in this conversation we're having as equals, it seems to me that, uh, and this should be clear, um, I mean, you, you are uh, an incredible expert, uh, but I don't like the word expert, uh, inhabitant, uh, hunter, uh, about books, about written texts, about, about literature, uh, which you cross and live in and relate to what is outside that forest, if you wish, which is life. Um, and I have the feeling you began, as it were, with books. I, um, I'm the opposite, uh, in fact. I mean, actually, I don't know so much about literature, and I don't know so much about books, uh, um, and I am not a very verbal person. I, I do know, I think, quite a lot about some things about life, in, but usually in a very inarticulate way. Uh, and then I try, I try to, to come with that onto the page. So it seems to me it's a very interesting situation between us because, because one of us is going from page to life and the other trying to go from life to page. Uh, and maybe that's... Maybe there's an intersection. <laughs> and maybe therefore there's an intersection. Um, because you see, for me, I was very shy as a child and books told me about the world and I depended on my writers to be worldly. And G is, in a sense, a very worldly book, yes? When you say that, you mean you read books in a way so that they could help you to live? Um, so that they would tell me how others had lived. 
<laughs> when when uh -huh. I start, you, I'm sure you do this too. Sometimes you reach a line in literature that's so beautiful that you start to cry yes. because this is it. Yes. And I think that when I read Peter Hantke's Casper play, and he says that Casper, the wild child's first sentence was, I want to be someone like someone else once was. This was an experience yeah. where I said, oh, I understand. Yeah. You know, I, I want to be someone the way somebody else once was. And I found these lives possibilities for life in books. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, I think, I mean, it's something that people don't talk about very much. And maybe, and of course it has actually changed a great deal because of the new media and television. But, I mean, until, until 50 years ago, I th it seems to me there was another function about books, uh, in a way more superficial, but, but at the same time very important, which is that when you were young, in reading books, you also learned how to behave. Uh, in, uh, in certain situations. I know what you mean, but I think I learned how not to behave. <laughs> yeah, you know, the people around me were so busy behaving that I went to book. In other words, in one of your most recent books, to the wedding, the characters turn up the music very loudly, and it's said that they're trying to keep the din of the world yes. away from them. Yes, I used books the way you might use music to make a very, very noisy world for me to live in. And what I loved when I read Berger was to enter, in particular, the world of the village. It was a world I had not dreamed of. And before that, the world of G, a world of cunning, and a world of subterfuge, a world of sexuality a world of, dare I say so, the ag erotic aggression of Don Giovanni. These were all possibilities that a boy growing up in a house in a suburb with parents who didn't read and no readers around, you looked to the people who were worded. And I heard you first. I was using my eyes, but what I heard were the words. And I was always very taken by the naturalness with which, even when the novels are wittier, as in the case of G, the words always seem to speak out loud and to be very present. You know, the page makes language present in your work, I think. Michael, can we just go back one moment? Because when I said that books, um, stories that you read on the page, perhaps show you how to behave, uh, you took it by meaning how to behave well, how to be <laughs> polite, uh -huh. uh, how, to, how to behave conventionally. But it seems to me that it is much, much deeper than that. Uh, you know, when you are 11, or even when you're 17, um, okay, and uh, suddenly you find yourself, maybe for the first time, uh, in face of a woman who has just lost her man. He's just died ten minutes before, or, uh, something. How to behave? It's not a question then of manners. Uh, uh, or maybe you find yourself alone with a dead animal. Or maybe you, uh, or maybe, maybe you, you find yourself frightened on a river or something. I mean, th these are also, um, books and stories can also help us to know how to carry ourselves, what stance to take in front of situations. And it's at that level that I meant it, because, um, no, of course, I mean, I agree with you that, um, 
Uh, the books that mean most to me are the books that teach us subversion. Um, of course, subversion uh, in the face of the world as it is. Um, uh, books that suggest the honour of an alternative. I'm interested because you mention in the story about your um, an early teacher. Um, the story is called The Passeur, yeah. the, the Smuggler. Yes. Um, that he tells you that if you must cry, cry afterwards and cry among the people who love you. And I think it's what you're talking about when you say, what if you're with a dead animal? What, how do you respond as a surviving person rather than a shirker and a crier, yes? Yeah. Uh, it's, yes, yes, then that man, uh, who really existed, it's not a fiction. That man. It didn't he sound was, like and he, fiction. And he was, he was <laughs> called Ken, and he really was called Ken. But I tell you something very strange, because, uh, okay, how did that story come about? I really was in Krakowie, in Poland, and, uh, and I was in this market, and suddenly, suddenly, incredibly strongly, he was there. Um, uh, although it is how, how long ago, 40 years since I saw him. But, and of course I thought about him from time to time, but not daily or not weekly even, although I knew that I had an enormous debt towards him. But this is what I want to say, which is interesting. Because then I thought about him and remembered. And then I sat down and uh, took a piece of paper. And like that, I did drew a portrait of him. And it was an incredible, without thinking, really. Uh, and it was an incredible likeness. Uh, um, it surprised me. Uh, not when I was doing it, but afterwards, and looking at it, 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 was, it was him. And I think that is very interesting because it tells us something about the, the way memory works and the way that, the, that what is absent is present. Uh, or like, um, there's, a, there's a wonderful letter uh, by Rilke, uh, to the painter Balthus, when Balthus was a kid, you probably know it. Uh, uh, you remember it. Uh, and 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 he he and uh, Balthus has just lost a pet animal. It seems to me has died or something like that. And and Rilke says to him, I'm paraphrasing badly, but he says, um, uh, loss has a very strange and not contradictory relationship with the opposite of loss, which is possession. Uh, and in fact, when we lose something or somebody, uh, uh, if that thing that we have lost is important, uh, we begin to possess it internally more strongly than when we in inverted commas, possessed it externally. Um, and this story about the drawing, I mean, is, a, is a somewhere connected with that. Well, yes, but I, I think that for you it does begin with loss. I think that the work is very... Loss and ghosts, both. Lost ways of life, lost ways of thinking about survivors who survive not in life, but survive in a way of life, in a continued idea about life. Um, so that loss is, it seems to me, one of your main subjects in fiction. Well, you can see better than I, what are my subjects. As I say, the writer is never quite sure. Um, 
I mean, what I would say, if that is true, I would say firmly that it is not a loss or sense of loss that has anything to do with nostalgia. I mean, in a very curious way, it is a sense of loss which is directed towards the future. Mm. Tell me more about that. I don't know. I can't tell you more about that. <laughs> uh, You're not an easy one. But well, okay. Huh. But this. I mean, first of all, I mean, writers are benevolent or sometimes not thieves. They're always stealing. I'm stealing now, because what I'm now going to tell you, as though I've just thought of it, is not true. In actual fact, uh, a friend of mine who's a doctor, a woman doctor in London, uh, wrote me this last week. Um, and we were having a correspondence about the Fayum portraits, yeah, the Egyptian portraits painted by uh, Greek Egyptian painters, which were then placed uh, on, in, uh, uh, on the graves. Of, of the dead or, or the um, uh, sarcophagus and uh, mummies. And these are extraordinary portraits. Uh, um, um, and there are certain paintings by Goya which have the same kind of expression. But anyway, the point is that. Um, so people posed for these portraits knowing that they were going to be there to represent their presence after they were dead. And often they were still young and in good health. Huh? Uh, so they were sitting there and they were, they were saying, here I am. But, but in a certain sense, the painter was the painter of death. And they were also aware of what they would be afterwards. Uh, and at the same time, those paintings seen by others would represent the past when the painted person was still alive. So that you have in these incredibly simply painted and observed heads, you have three times coexisting, past, present and future. Uh, and then what my friend the doctor said was, and maybe Maybe that also happens when you have really great performances in the theatre. Uh, there is a coexistence simultaneously of past, present and future. That's very interesting. Do you, do you think about novels in that way? Novels representing... Tell me more what you... A meeting point of the past, the present, and the future. Um, into the wedding, for instance, the characters seem to be destined, hurtled toward a wedding, the way a river is hurtled through a landscape, the way the father is hurtling on his motorcycle. There's all a huge sense of futurity, and yet this is not preparations for a Bruegel wedding. This is a world in which there is AIDS and death and a decision to commit to not the boisterousness of a wedding, but the boisterousness of a wedding despite the fact. So there's a sense of what a wedding was in the past, what a wedding can be now, what a wedding will be in the future, the novel seems to stand at a point at which it's projecting its action across past, present, and future, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I, I have difficulty, I have difficulty in, um, really, in talking in a intelligible way about time, about any way linear time. Um, because somewhere deeply in my, 
I'm not sure whether to say in my imagination or in my soul. Somewhere deeply, it seems to me that uh, all instants coexist. Uh, um, and if you ask me about writing stories or a novel, um, uh, ah. the aim is not necessarily what I achieve, God Almighty, but the aim is that every incident, every word, every silence, above all every silence in that story, coexists, uh, uh, is instantaneous at, in the same instant. Uh, and this is the, the this is the sense of urgency that I have uh, when when trying to write, um, and it's also actually something that I feel when I'm not writing and not thinking about writing, uh, and when I'm living. Um, yeah, so that I can describe, but I can't explain. And then when we start talking about the past or the present or the future, um, um, suddenly, uh, suddenly I feel that we are a tram on rails, uh, whereas before we were bounding like hares. <laughs> it's interesting because urgency is one of your constant words, as is confidence. And the first time I see them together is in that Cubism essay. Uh, the moment of Cubism, when you speak about the urgency of the movement and the confidence of the movement, and it occurs in your fiction, it occurs everywhere. These seems, seem to be the primary virtues for you, for an artist. Yes, uh, uh, but isn't, it, isn't that quite lived, um, by which I mean, uh, if you are in an urgent situation, which inevitably means also somewhat dangerous situation, and if you know, coming back to what we were saying, if you know how you want to face that, how, in inverted commas, to behave, <laughs> at that moment, you experience a confidence that is incomparable and that you can find under no other circumstances. And when things are easy and there's no urgency, there is no confidence as, uh, uh, as strong as that one. It's interesting that you say so because I have to tell you that the qualities that I relish most in your fiction are qualities of tenderness, quietness, almost although you use these words, it's almost the opposite of urgency. It's a quality of wisdom that I find there. And it's almost, I don't know how to put it, it's very understated. The narrative voice is almost sotto voce, as if this voice, which is speaking now, has never not been speaking. The stories that are being told were always being told and told in this way. Yes, there's a change of time, but always the stories are fresh, and yet always the stories are ancient, and refer to, oh, I don't know, values and honor that are somehow maintained against many different odds. When I read them, I often find myself crying because they return me to a kind of peacefulness that isn't very common in my life that I look for in fiction now. You see, I, I think that fiction is one of the places where we go for silence, you know, a worded silence, words that amount to a return to silence, and that the best fiction maybe even aspires to a kind of muteness, Yes, I, I, I agree with it. both those things, the silence and the muteness. Uh, yes, and 
also that silence. Um, um, isn't there in it an extraordinary sense of being inside? Uh, um, that is to say, uh, but, but inside without what normally accompanies the notion or the experience of being inside, which is a sense of containment. Uh, there, is, there, it is, there, is, there is no containment and yet one is at inside in an in interior inside. And I reject totally the very, very short-sighted Freudian explanation that this is simply a, a, a desire to return to the womb. Uh, no, 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 uh, no. Um, no. What, what I think, you see, I didn't understand it until I got here to this place. But you see, I think that what happens on the pages of these books is that they aspire to the quietness of this environment and that really you found yourself something I could not have known until I got here because I've always lived in cities. And this work is full of the divisions between country and city and the reason why the country is to some extent disappearing as people move to the city. I think that what you have is around you I'm looking out of a window, you see, and I'm looking at something that comes as close to me as looking eternal as I know how to see these mountains. And many writers who are writing in an environment in which there's a lot of activity, a lot of action, they're keeping things rolling, keep it moving, keep it jumping, is the motto of the fiction. This is a fiction. I'm only sitting here understanding this by being across from the window and across from you. This is a fiction of slowing down. This is a fiction of finding the rhythms that are more natural to eternity than to excitement. I don't... I... Um, I don't know. Why not? Uh, yeah? Why well, not? Why not? What don't you? Um, uh, It doesn't. It doesn't. F I mean, I see what you mean, and I think. I mean, I, and of course, it's very perceptive what you say. And I mean, I can put myself very easily in your in in your skin and see it like that. And and. Um, uh, no, 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 but skip perceptive. I know that you ride motorcycles. I know, therefore, that you like speed. I know that what I'm saying about mm. slowing things down couldn't possibly be entirely correct <laughs> because you wouldn't be a motorcycle guy yeah, yeah. if that were true. Yes. And yet I'm speaking with a kind of conviction as someone who's just read and reread the bulk of your work that what I see throughout the work is a growing education in tenderness, in slowness, in eternal values, um, in what is conserved in a life. I think that the essence of the conservation instinct is in a ghost story, whether it's a ghost story in which you see your teacher, you conserve your past, or a ghost story like the one in Pig Earth in which we hear about three lives of a woman who is a ghost being narrated more remarkably by a man who is a ghost as well. <laughs> so, you know, the question becomes, what has become more baffling, more eerie, more 
displaced and lost, then these incredibly vivid figures who are living a phantasmal erotic life before you on the page in a situation that doesn't exist. There are no more characters in this story. We don't know it, but everyone in the story is dead. The story is silence enunciating itself. A once upon a time action that is cleared out of the living spaces, and now we are re-encountering story in the air itself. I think this is closer to what I'm trying to say. Yes. Um, uh, tenderness is, well, first of all, I suppose, first of all, one has to begin with the fact which everybody has always known until recently that life is full of pain, not only pain, but it is also has a lot of pain. And tenderness is in part a response to that. But it is also something else. It, uh, it seems to me that uh, it is a refusal to judge. Uh, it seems to me that actions have to be judged with incredible re rigor and 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 all the time declared. Uh, it is not that uh, that, that I, I I don't think that life should, um, or that uh, I mean there is so much that has to be judged, so much that has to be denounced, and also so much that has to be praised. Uh, but not people. Uh, the, 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 I do not think that we have the right of any final uh, judgment of anybody. And, and tenderness is, in a way, an expression of that refusal to judge. Um, it is also something uh, which, which exists completely apart from uh, so-called intellectual development uh, and also uh, apart from given cultures. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, and it's also, it is, uh, it is, uh, there are so many modes of tenderness. Um, uh, um, from, from the uh, powerless to to the erotic, for example. Um, okay. Uh, and this is perhaps connected with, that's the other thing that you were saying, you were talking about uh, ghosts um, and the past. Okay, I would put this differently because it seems to me uh, and has really almost always seemed to me that the dead are present. Uh, actually, uh, we, 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 we live with the dead. Uh, um, and this is, of course, something that in our instant culture, uh, this moment in, in, in a large part of the world, um, is, is ignored, uh, dismissed totally. Um, um, but uh, this living with the dead is maybe uh, the first thing which distinguishes man, man as a species. Uh, uh, it, it is perhaps what makes man uh, human. If I feel this very intensely, I mean, I would give, and have always done, I mean, maybe two explanations. One uh, was, wrong tense, is my father, um, who, who was, uh, who was uh, in the First World War, infantry officer, uh, um, four years in the trenches, uh, wounded but but survived, 
um, for four years. Very, very few infantry officers survived that long. Um, and well, I could talk about him, but that's not really important. But I sensed his experience uh, from the, t the time when I was very young. It was not something he talked about. Um, sometimes I would hear his nightmares. Um, but it deeply marked me. And if you like, I mean, I can just read you a, a poem I wrote, which I'll is really, a, which is about that. Um, and it's called Self-Portrait, that's to say, Self-Portrait of Me. Uh, so, Self-Portrait, 1914 to 18. It seems now that I was so near to that war. I was born eight years after it ended, when the general strike had been defeated. Yet I was born by very light and shrapnel on duck boards among limbs without bodies. I was born of the look of the dead swaddled in mustard gas and fed in a dugout. I was the groundless hope of survival with mud between finger and thumb born near Abbeville. I lived the first year of my life, between the leaves of a pocket Bible stuffed in a khaki haversack. I lived the second year of my life with three photos of a woman kept in a standard issue army pay book. In the third year of my life, at 11 a.m. on November the 11th, 1918, I became all that was conceivable. Before I could see, before I could cry out, before I could go hungry, I was the world fit for heroes to live in. Then, uh, when I came here, 25 or more years ago, to live among mountain peasants. Uh, this was an extraordinary confirmation of, of what I'm talking about. Because for them, uh, it is a completely accepted fact uh, that they live with the dead, that the dead are here, and that they will be the dead, and that the dead, the dead in a certain sense, are there to help them die. Um, so I, I, would, I would put it in this terms of the presence of the dead uh, rather, rather than the past, <laughs> I, uh, um, um, which always uh, implies or often implies a kind of nostalgia. Um, yes. Uh, or, or not, if not a nostalgia, a, uh, a conservatism in a, in a global, global sense. Um, um, because, if I could just go on for one moment, and if we come back to the tenderness now, um, it seems to me that one of the essential elements in tenderness is that it is a free a gratuitous act. It has an enormous amount to do with liberty, with freedom, because one chooses uh, to be tender. Uh, and, and in a certain sense, in face of so often what is surrounding us, I mean, it is, a, it is an almost defiant act uh, of freedom. Uh, and and then if we just go back one moment more to something else you said, because it connects. You asked me about motorbikes and riding at high speed or riding motorbikes and so on and so on. Um, and, I mean, one of the things about riding um, bikes, and it's not really to do with speed, it, um, is that it is a very intense experience, I think, 
both psychic and physical, of freedom. But it's very necessary to say what one means by that. It, it isn't actually uh, getting to the, uh, the, the traffic lights at the top and then being the first <laughs> off. I mean, there is that. There is that. But, but, that's, but, it, but, that's, but the, the real freedom is something different. It is that when riding a bike, you make a decision. Uh, uh, you observe. You observe. You observe. You observe everything all the time. Uh, and then you make a decision. And the consequences of that decision come almost immediately. And at the same time, there is no, you have very little protection, physical protection against them. So that uh, between decision and consequence, they are not absolutely instantaneous, but they are like that. Mm. Yes, you decide something and it happens, for good or bad. Um, whereas um, in, in the rest of life, inevitably, inevitably, I mean, the time is more delayed or, or there are many, many more constricting uh, considerations or factors. There is more friction, if you wish, uh, uh, between decision and consequence. And that is, in a very lived sense, something which seems to me to touch um, not necessarily the essence, but, but something very deep about what I mean by freedom. And then to change it back, as I said, uh, that same freedom is uh, nothing to do with that kind of uh, power or, or speed or whatever. I mean, it is to do almost with its opposite. It is the, the, the free choice in some way by gesture or glance or action of tenderness. Well, this, if I can improvise here, reminds me very much of what Christ says about marionettes when he says that they are... Yes? Yes, uh, yes. Okay, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but, yes but, 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 but say, but say, say. Well, well say. essentially he tells us that the great marionette theaters, that the human being in his eye aspires to the role of the marionette, not the kinds from it, but that we should experience a state in which we are dependent on our strings to show in relation what our souls are, not our humanity. So it sounds as if the way you're talking about the motorcycle is that it becomes a vehicle for the operation of the soul. Yes, mm -hmm. in a way? Mm -hmm. Because what, what Christ is trying to say is that our freedom is exceedingly limited, and when we think we're exhibiting it, we're frequently only showing our bondage. But our true freedom is the ability to move within a sphere that has nothing to do with will, that has entirely to do, I would think, with what you're calling the consequence of a decision, a consequence that arrives immediately upon the decision. Just like the puppet whose arm goes up when the string goes up, so the body that swerves when you decide to turn this way instead of that, and you had better incline because otherwise you'll throw yourself. You live in your own consequence and that becomes freedom, yeah? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But this is, this is really one of the central texts of romanticism. It is that asking at every moment, can the soul rise from the human and display itself? Yes. Yes. Navalis. Yes, Navalis as well. Absolutely. Yes. Mm. yes. Now, you see, one of the reasons that I love reading your essays is because every time I turn around, you are citing, now you say to me, that you're not, you're a person who went from the world to books. But somehow or other, we've shared certain crucial texts over the years with one another. Um, one is Hugo von Hofmannsthal, mm -hmm. one is Apollinaire, and also Leopardi. Um, 
And so whenever I'm reading Berger, I'm really, I have a belief that the real books are not the books that people know about. For some reason, either they're not taught, or they're not translated, or they're not translated well enough. And so people are living in the absence of the food they need, the literary food that you would need in order to feel life. And I've always thought that what literature was to you was the expression of certain ideas that would make it possible to feel more deeply. Uh, he, ideas? Ideas or, or something else? Um, I call ideas, what I mean by ideas is an older Greeker thing. Yes. I mean image. I mean yes. 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 yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Ah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um. What to uh, uh, of course, I mean we're talking up to now quite a lot um, about all oh, the motivations of writing or, or uh, well autobiog biographically or autobiographically um, I mean in my experience. Um, there is also actually another kind of writing, um, um, which is uh, which is to do with the world, uh, which is to do with something happening. Uh, I mean, it, it can be something quite private and small. I mean, small in, in uh, yeah, small private, or, or it can be something huge and global. Uh, when Witnessing that, uh, reacting to it, uh, um, and, and I do react and think very quickly. Uh, that, that is true. I mean, there's no credit to me. It's just I, this is my metabolism. Anyway, reacting to that, um, there is then the obligation to write. This has to be said. Not, be, not really by, by me, it doesn't matter who says it, but it has to be said because it is needed. Or another, another saying, one could say, this needs to be read at this moment. Mm. Uh, um, and in some ways, uh, if one thinks, if one talks of oneself as a storyteller, I mean, often, often I have the feeling that um, the role of the storyteller is misunderstood because, you know, storytellers don't invent stories. I mean, the story is the story is found, or is told, or is somewhere there, and then you you take it and you you write it or you tell it, and it goes there, and you, and you you have delivered it. You have delivered it. Yes. Yes. Uh, um, and in the in the same way, this this other kind of writing in which one has to respond to what is happening because this needs to be read. I mean, in a sense, once more, you are simply a channel uh, uh, um, for that, uh, to which you make yourself open. And that's, well, that's another kind of writing. And I mean, um, I mean, sometimes this can simply be because you've suddenly found a uh, an unknown painter or an unknown poet or, or something who you think is really incredible and you can't stay silent about it or it can be it can be uh, that it is now absolutely necessary to speak out everybody in the loudest possible way against this monstrously proposed war against Iraq um, and and um, that kind of writing has always occupied more of my time than I would wish uh, but but uh, we 
haven't chosen the world into which we have been thrown. Uh, it is, um, um, but we have to try to make sense of it. Now, I'm interested here because yesterday, or last night, we were speaking a bit, and several times, thank you, um, you said, this is a story that happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I'm very interested in this phrase. Because someone else might say, this is something that happened yesterday. What is a story that happened yesterday? <laughs> ah, mm. what is the difference between a happening and a story? Something that comes to you as a story, and that is very interesting to me, because I think it's a crucial thing that happens to writers, that a story happens rather than an event. Well, I, I suppose the first thing to say, which is um, very clear when you think about it, but I mean, most people, um, maybe when you hear the story, you don't think about this, um, is that all stories begin with their end. I mean, until there is an end, which may, which it, it hasn't I mean, been a story. It, it, it isn't a story. Yes, yes. yes. I mean, the end isn't necessarily definitive. It may simply be a, the 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 the, uh, the laugh line of a joke, but but it it, it is the end. Yes. Um, um, then, then, um, what else is it um, about a story? Um, in some kind of way, isn't it to do with the fact that um, the events related form a kind of, uh, well, one could say magnetic field, or one could say constellation, uh, with a certain symmetry. Uh, um, um, and that in that magnetic field, in that constellation, this is ideal, what I'm saying now, every word in that story um, is made fresh uh, um, or is, shall we say, clean. Um, um, arguments uh, uh, cannot do that. I mean, written arguments cannot do that so much. Uh, uh, it, is, it is a poet, but poetry is the supreme. The, the supreme example of that, uh, the, uh, when, when the poem is re really good. Um, but stories also do that. Um, and because, because it is so, so, so uh, important today to, because we are surrounded by words that have been hijacked, f made utterly filthy, contradict, I mean, c contradicting their o own sense and the words with which people deceive themselves to, and, and which, 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 which actually uh, leads to evil, evil acts. Uh, not e there's no other kind of evil. Um, 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 because, uh, um, uh, evil work works with words. <laughs> um, um, uh, what else do I mean by a story? You tell me what stories mean to you. You, the, you, the reader, tell me. Well, when I was given only yesterday, um, Pessoa to read, I thought, well, isn't this interesting? We are in a Polish square in Krakow. A story happened yesterday 
I thought I saw the ghost of my teacher in a square in Poland. Now, stories are made in part of mystery because nothing in this story, and it's almost thrilling, is going to tell us why we see him in Poland at that point. He dies in New Zealand, in fact. We've never had anything in the story that's brought us to Poland, but this square is the situation of a dream. And like a dream, everything that happens in it happens in the past, the present, and the future in that a young woman is selling. Now, I'm fascinated. I didn't really know. When I read Pig Earth, I first encountered someone who doesn't know how to sell and therefore sits at the side of the market, not raising her voice and maybe not selling anything. And similarly, in this Polish market, this contemporary market, there are these women, yet again, they're present, eternally present as in a dream. They are the ones who sit but don't sell. But the John character, the John character approaches one of them, thinks that she's selling something that looks like chess pieces. It turns out to be cheese. He buys three pieces. <laughs> if they were chess pieces, <laughs> maybe only one. Um, there's mystery, magic, and repetition. That's necessary, it seems to me, to a story. Yes. The sense that you are hearing voices that you are, have already heard from somewhere else. In other words, creeping up through your books, every time I read a new story now, there are echoes from the other stories that say to me, this is a story by John Berger. The world of the other stories is creeping in through the cracks of this story so that there is a hugeness in the world. Then, for me, that I, this is almost... Well, I'm very charmed by it, but more and more in the stories there'll be a John or a Jean. Your name will proliferate, and yet these are not egotistical fictions. So I'm very interested in the ghostly presence of the writer in the form, almost as if the story is whispering your name, whispering versions of your name, Jean, John. It, it's it's. It's very funny to me, sometimes they're male, sometimes they're female, that the presence of the writer is there, but not there as an ego gesture, but there the way anything else would be there in a dream, as an eternal gesture. He must be there, how could you have a dream without a dreamer? But the question is, who is the dreamer who dreams the dream? And I think that when I read a story by John Berger, part of what I'm trying to learn is who is the dreamer who is dreaming this dream. He's come to a village. There are all sorts of rules in Pig Earth, rules about how to handle animals, rules about how to court, rules about how to marry. And part of this story is how does John Berger fit into this world? He's come as a stranger, but is he a stranger? Look at how intimately he's writing this story. How could he be a stranger? And yet, how can he be intimate with it? It's a totally anomalous and alien world. Now, you have to understand, I think of your fiction, especially your later fiction, as a kind of miracle. I don't think people, many people, as many people as will know this miracle, know it yet. Part of what I like in talking to you is that I suspect that people will have to find out about this miracle because I don't think it's in any other writer. I think that you have mastered not only a world that you've made yours, but a world that your relation to is mysterious, that the world invokes you as much as you invoke the world. Michael, maybe i just read you a short poem because we were talking about language and um, 
and who does it belong to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so this is just a, a little poem called Words. The tongue is the spine's first leaf. Forests of language surround it. Like a mole, the tongue burrows through the earth of speech. Like a bird, the tongue flies in arcs of the written word. The tongue is tethered and alone in its mouth. Um, but, but also, hmm, I, I, I wanted to, uh, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs> which happened yesterday. <laughs> not yesterday, but not long ago. It's not, but, 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 but because because it seems to me something which we, we, we refer to, but but um, it's worth bringing out, which is the thing about surprise. Um, and it seems to me that that that, that actually. Uh, Exactly the, the, the art of storytelling is the art of reinventing or reliving or finding for the first time surprises. Uh, uh, surprise, I mean, the, the fuse never catches light in a story unless there is surprise. Not only for the reader, but, but, but for the storyteller. Uh, um, and it's not a, story, not a surprise that the storyteller creates, it's a surprise that life offers. So, I mean, um, and because there's the garden out there, you were looking through that window and there's the garden, and through that window there are some black currant bushes, and every year in the month of uh, late June, July, uh, we, we, we collect all those black currants and, and we make a kind of um, Sewer with them, so a kind of cordial, uh, which is very good, much better than what you can buy. And um, so I was, I was collecting them, uh, hands like this and the leaves, um, and your hands get uh, wonderfully uh, blueberry coloured. Huh? Um, and when one of the things about black currants, and especially the leaves, is this very, very strong heady smell that they have. Oh, it's an absolutely unique smell. Um, and just if you touch, or even when you approach the bush, you have it. And when you touch the leaves, it becomes stronger. So I was uh, picking these berries, putting them into a pail, pail. And then I noticed right away that on the, on the leaves, there were tiny living, little white snails, about the size of my little fingernail. White, white, pearly silver. And they, there were many of them on the leaves because obviously they adore eating those. Hmm? Um, and in picking the, the berries, by accident, sometimes I would take a leaf, uh, which I would throw out, or a snail. So that after, after an hour or so, half an hour, I mean, this bucket was there and it was this high with, with, with black currants. Um, and then I saw two or three snails who had fallen there amongst the black currants. Thought crossed my mind that maybe, maybe in a, black, in a bucket of blackberries, that is a snail scene of paradise. <laughs> uh, um, um, then I thought, huh, okay, I've finished the things, so maybe I will, yeah, I looked one, picked one up. I thought, yeah, okay, I'll do a drawing. I'd like to draw these snails. So I went to get some paper and I put the snails uh, on the table outside in the garden. And I mean, the, 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 the incredible tension of those spirals is absolutely extraordinary. It's like, uh, it's um, something that Leonardo knew, knew about. Well, I'm no Leonardo and so it was, uh, but I, I began drawing, and because they were there on the table, I mean, I knew I wasn't drawing a person or a dog or a bird in the sky, so I took my time. But very quickly, after about 
a minute, I saw that these snails were in fact moving, moving all the while. So I would look, and it had already moved. Uh, the angle of the shell had shifted as its weight on its body had shifted, and then, and then, it's, then its body is, it's, would, would, would begin to move. And, and, and I went on like that, but suddenly I realized that they moved really at an extraordinary speed. Uh, um, um, and I concentrated on two others, and then, and then there was this one there, and a few minutes, and the other one had actually got to the edge of the table. So, nothing, just a story about the surprise of observing with what speed, when you're really watching them, snails move. <laughs> well, well, this reminds me of, and, and even my description of what I find in your stories. In the book that was published in Britain as The White Bird, but in America as The Sense of Sight, mm -hmm. there is almost a climax, a culmination to these essays. It's almost as if they're not exactly narrative, but what Laura Ryden called a progress of essays. And toward the end, you have the essay on Leopardi, followed by, I think, what is really a connecting essay, the production of the world. And yeah. what you, in essence, say is that what the artist makes is the production of the world, that the artist is engaged in the process of the production of the world. It's almost as if this is what a snail does when it moves in front of an artist's eyes. He's adding to the production of the artist's sight, which then, in the form of a drawing, a narration, adds to the production of the world. In other words, if we were to create a new theory of production and mass production, we would say that every movement in the world has a counter-movement in the eye, and that this leads to a picture or a story if the person seeing happens to be an artist. Now, the other thing that I think of in what you're telling me, and I hadn't thought about it in your work before, although now it seems very obvious. People used to ask Dr. William Collis Williams why he didn't move away from Patterson. And he would say, who will record the language of Polish grandmothers? <laughs> yeah? Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. No, no, no. Beautiful. I, I, I think that this is, you know, that, this, that what I was describing as the world inventing you as you invent it in these stories, which might be a Calvino idea or a Saul Steinberg idea, but really is that sense that the world is constantly in production and that we, in our motion through it, are part of the production of the world. Yes. 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 Yes, I, I, I would formulate it like that exactly. Yeah, I don't know of another writer whose sense of living is that living adds to living. It's almost as if you need a Kantian term to define this almost inspired sense that what we are and how we move adds to the universe of the universe. <laughs> maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe um, visual artists uh, are more aware of this than, than, than writers. Um, it seems to me it's possible. Um, um, why? Uh, um, um, well, that's complicated. I'm, I'm not sure that I can answer it. Um, but it, but it, it, it 
I mean, in fact, that article, uh, Production of the World, I mean, the, the starting point is Van Gogh, I think, mm -hmm. isn't That's it? That's right. Um, but I mean, and well, the, he's a very good example, but it's not And that no unique. one has before seen the world at its axis, that what he does in decomposing these objects is adding to the store of what we know of these objects and what yes. we mean when we say an object in the world. This is a very profound thing, I think, you know, that somehow or other, well, Gertrude Stein says it in uh, The Making of Americans, she says, and everyone is imagining some such thing, that whether we know it or not, when we look at a painting, when we read a story, when we progress through the itemization of the world's detail, that we are producing world, and everyone is imagining some such thing, whether they know it or not, that living, the thing that makes living bearable as opposed to the pain you're talking about, or the pain you talk about that Leopardi feels, is that he is adding to the world itself in his perception. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah.